from T. Uh, we've got our last session now, which is demystifying the peer review process. We've got a question and answer session with uh, Jennifer Wright from CUP. Uh, she is the University Publishing Manager at Cambridge University Press, before which she was a postdoc in ecology at Oregon State University and a PhD student at, student at Edinburgh University. She works close to the OSC here in Cambridge and has developed this session following its very successful debut at our recent workshop on helping researchers publish. Uh, so this is going to be more of an interactive session, I think, with lots of questions and answers, so I hope you do enjoy. Yeah, thanks very much, Lauren, and thank you to Martha and everyone for having me here today. Um, as Lauren just said, I was a PhD student and postdoc myself up until about two years ago, so hopefully I still have a vague inkling of what it's like to be in your shoes. Um, before I carry on, I just wanted to get an idea of who's in the room. So I know we have some publishers, but how many of you have been peer-reviewed before? Okay, good. So you're all quite experienced from that point of view. Um, and how many of you have done a peer review? Okay. So, and certainly after the rest of the sessions you've seen today, you're probably quite familiar with kind of the process. So I'll probably skip over a few of my slides, um, but hopefully you'll still find some of the insights into what happens at kind of the publisher end kind of interesting. Um, those of you who went to the cloth workshop earlier, some of this might be a bit of repetition. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, but first of all, I thought I'd just start off by saying that what I did before I put this presentation together was essentially asked some of my friends. This wasn't scientific, but I was just kind of interested in whether or not, you know, like my experience of doing peer review when I was a researcher was common to other peer reviewers. Um, so I said, what, what was your first experience like? Um, how did you get started? Uh, and is there anything you'd wish you'd known? So basically, most of them said, oh, sorry, Hannah's telling me to move over. Um, does this work with the clicker instead of the mouse? Okay. Um, yeah, so they basically all said kind of common things. Uh, they spent too much time on it. They didn't really know if they were supposed to comment on the language. Um, they got passed a paper by their supervisor and asked to review it. They didn't know if that was okay. Um, they didn't really say anything about the fit for the journal. Um, some people seemed quite um, analytical or uh, thoughtful about how they approached it. So they went and did some research about how to do peer review. And this, the guide that I'll mention later, uh, the guide from AGU, um, has actually been recommended to me by three different people separately. So I've got a reference to that later that you can all look at. Um, but essentially, it sounds like my experience is kind of similar. I spent absolutely ages on my first peer review, probably a week, not continuously, obviously, <laughs> but probably like, you know, a couple of hours a day, sleeping on it a bit, thinking about how I should phrase things. Like, it, it took a long time. Um, I'll tell you what the average is a bit later. I tested my slides, but only the, the first one. There we go. I'll go back to clicking. Is it all right if I don't stand here? Um, so you've probably, you're probably all familiar this, with this uh, process. What I wanted to stress really with this slide is the, the far gray box that says read the letter. So uh, before you go and cry or sort of drown yourself in wine or beer or whatever, please do read the letter. Sometimes reject isn't reject. Sometimes reject is um, please just you know, re revisit this bit and then we're still interested in the paper. Sometimes it's, we recommend you have some language editing and then we're interested in the paper. Sometimes it's like, we really like it, but it's not a fit for us. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your hard work is rubbish by any means. Um, and what I'm going to talk about next is basically what happens within this box here. Um, I think you've probably heard a lot about different types of peer review already today. The one thing I will add here, though, is that such a thing as triple blind exists. So I didn't actually know this, even though I work for a publisher, but some journals, like particularly in, I don't know, political science and things, they actually have a system where the editor themselves that makes the decision on the manuscript doesn't know who anybody is in the process. So it's like entirely anonymous. And Karina mentioned something earlier. She said, who's, who's sort of peer reviewing the editors? Um, and in a sense, this is an attempt to get around that. It's sort of, well, if the editors don't know who's, you know, who's part of the process, then they have the same sort of objectivity as the reviewers and the authors would have in the process. So as promised, this session is basically going to focus on things that um, we at CUP often get asked by early career researchers. So first of all, about being a peer reviewer. And here they are. Do any of these sound familiar? I'm seeing nods. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to focus on the, the bits that are kind of, I guess, behind the scenes, like what we do at a publishing house that you may or may not know about. Um, so how do we pick peer reviewers? 
I did a sort of straw poll at work and nearly everyone said they look at the reference list first. Like that's kind of their first port of call to get an idea of, you know, where the paper sits, kind of which research groups they might be able to approach for a reviewer. Um, if it's maybe a bit more interdisciplinary, like which other disciplines they're drawing on, and it kind of gives them a good idea of the paper. Um, they then probably go and do some searches around those and look for people that if they don't know them already, uh, what they're working on. Um, and then they normally will like add people to their own database. So nearly all journals, however, it might be really sophisticated and huge, or it might just be like a Word document with names. But nearly every journal will have some kind of database of reviewers that they can go and look up. Um, if any of you have submitted articles, which judging by the show of hands, you probably all have, um, you're sometimes asked to suggest reviewers. So you might say, you know, I think these three people would be good candidates to review the paper. Um, spoiler, I'm going to tell you what happens with those later. Um, and also publishers do tend to pay for sort of industry tools like Scholar One, Editorial Manager, Publons, um, and these tools basically allow them to just sort of do quicker searching, essentially. So what they do is they, the, the services match the keywords or semantic fingerprint of the article to other articles and sort of shortcut some of that. Anecdotally, and I don't know if some of these services know this, but what editors actually do is they look at the results from that and then make their own decision anyway. So some of them run a model where they kind of, um, essentially you, the, the model that, that you pay by is having a system where if you select one of their recommendations, then you know, you've used the service or you've paid it. So they sometimes use it as like a sense check, you know, saying like, yes, this is kind of who I thought would be suitable. I'm glad that agrees. Other times they use it to get a general idea and then they go off and do their own searches anyway. Um, do you monitor performance of peer reviewers? And in the PLOS workshop earlier, we heard about this. Uh, the short answer is yes, we do. Um, people are very suspicious of publishers and they seem to think that we're all out to get everybody. Um, we do monitor peer reviewer performance, but it's actually not necessarily for the reasons you might think. It's so we can kind of avoid overworking peer reviewers, um, and it's to ensure that good reviews are valued. So, as they mentioned in the PLOS workshop, we do actually intervene if we, you know, if we do get like an aggressive reviewer that's not submitting helpful reviews, um, we will track that so that we don't, because you know, it's not helpful to us, it's not helpful to our journals, it's not helpful to authors, it's not helpful to research. Sorry. Um, so my question is, uh, do you then give some feedback to the author in case you flag an issue and this and the, uh, reviewer's feedback already got to the author before, before it was flagged? Mm. Do you get back to him? Because sometimes it can be quite traumatizing. Yeah, yeah. So knowing that, well, actually, you feel really bad about this review, but you know what? You are right. You know, it was inappropriate, and we are yeah. going to take actions. That is, that would be a really positive, uh, and a positive message, especially for early career researchers. That can be quite yeah. scary. So the interesting thing is, and I think Klaus touched on this as well earlier, um, that there's actually like a layer between us and the authors normally, and that's the editors. So what we do do is, and sometimes it'd be quite like diplomatically tricky, is you find, if you find there is an editor who is essentially not fulfilling their obligations in the right way, in other words, they're allowing bad reviews or they're not checking reviews, then part of the publisher's role is to kind of understand the dynamics of the editorial board and try and like seek replacements if they're not behaving as they should. So part of that would be, I guess, if there was a situation where an editor was allowing that that to go on, that we would kind of call the editor out on that and hope that they would sort of pass on to the authors, you know, like, we are aware that this was a situation and I'm sorry that you had, to, you know, so it's, it's kind of like we're a step removed. Um, so I don't think we could directly contact the author for that purpose, but we, we do try and sort of instill in our editors best practice so that they should do that. Um, oh yeah, the other reason we monitor sort of good reviews is a lot of editors are interested in good reviewers for future editorial board potential. So they'll, if you if you constantly provide that journal with good reviews, they might think that you know your kind of objective and sound response is like an indicator that you're the kind of person that would make an objective and fair and sound editor. So that's another reason why they might sort of keep track in this sort of database of editors and reviewers um, how, you, how you perform as a peer reviewer. 
Uh, there are, again, sort of tools that publishers pay for that provide kind of more empirical metrics around how often certain reviewers reject articles, how long it normally takes them to turn articles around, um, how long it was since they last reviewed. And again, this is also that you can kind of keep track of, of reviewer behavior um, and reward the good ones. Uh, and related to that, do we ever block reviewers? Um, not really, no. So the answer, I, I asked people at work about this and they said they very rarely kind of block, but as you just asked there, Lauren, if, if there is an issue, then we will. Um, so if we do get sort of inappropriate and unprofessional reviews, then we will remove them from the list of reviewers that we'll contact. Um, we also do it if people request not to, you know, not to be a reviewer for a particular journal, which they might do for a variety of reasons. Maybe they've moved out of academia, they're overworked, they're on maternity leave, whatever. So we'll mark them as like inactive in that case. Um, if they never respond, we generally stop trying. Uh, and if they frequently say, yes, sure, I'll review, but then never return a review, then again, we might mark them as inactive. Okay, so this next batch of questions um, is kind of how you get started. And I think Prof more or less covered all of this as well, so I might whiz through it quite quickly. Although, how many of you were in the other data session and not the Prof session? Okay, so there's a few of you who won't have seen this then. Um, how do you become a peer reviewer? The most obvious thing is to, is to publish, because as I mentioned earlier, a lot of editors will look at reference lists for journals for like, getting an idea of where the article fits. So if you're publishing in that area, uh, then you're likely picked up by the editors. Um, one thing that PLOS didn't say that I think was linked into everything they did say was make sure that your information is update, up to date online. So if you have a department website, a research group website, a university profile, an ORCID ID, any of those things, make sure that it's kind of kept up to date to what you're working on, what your current email address is. It's a really simple thing, but I mean, most editors will go like, oh, they might be a good reviewer, Google. And then if nothing comes up or it doesn't look like you've done anything for a few years, then they might go, hmm, I don't know. So it's good to keep your, to keep your sort of profile online up to date. Um, be active. This is stuff that I guess you would do anyway if you're trying to kind of ensure that your research gets communicated and to sort of develop your career. Um, but some editors will look at conference um, proceedings, conference um, programs, um, session conveners, that kind of thing, to get an idea of who's, who's working in that discipline. Um, give seminars, be active in societies, all the kind of things that you would do anyway. Um, blogging. I know some people that some communities are very active on Twitter, and if people know through that what you're kind of working on, then it's kind of a good way of getting your name known and out there. And finally, ask. So uh, you, you can just email an editor of a journal and say, I'm really interested in this discipline, and I work in this discipline, and I have been researching this discipline for however many years. I'd be keen to be a reviewer for your journal. They're always looking for reviewers, so there's no reason why not. Um, in response to sort of questions like this, Cambridge have actually set up a, a specific email address so that if you are interested but you're not necessarily sure which journal would be most appropriate or uh, the other way around, if you if you found a journal but you don't know who to contact, um, you can email this authorhub at cambridge.org email address uh, with a little short summary of what research you do uh, and then we can kind of try and match you to one of our journals if you're interested in doing that. Um, similarly, you can ask your supervisor and say that you're sort of keen to get experience. Um, and then how do you actually get practice? So say you've been invited to a peer review. Uh, do you just jump in at the deep end? Um, you can, yeah. That's what, you know, a lot of people do, and a lot of people, that is the experience they have. Just one day that a paper comes their way, and then they, you know, that's it. They've done their first peer review. Um, but you can kind of practice in advance by looking at sort of open peer review systems, uh, preprint servers, you can sort of comment on those. Um, as Plus also, also mentioned, we have some journals that have kind of mentorship programs, so you can sign up to those with certain societies, uh, and they will sort of pair you with more experienced reviewers, which means you can sort of carry out the review, and then at the end of the process, you'll have a, um, like a kind of report from the other reviewers and the editor and sort of say, you know, like, it was really good that you picked up on this and it'll sort of help you to sort of frame your, frame your reviewing in the future. Um, you can review things that your supervisor gives you, just declare it, like that's the main thing, both for your own benefit if you want to get credit for doing so, um, but also in case there's a conflict of interest, so your supervisor might not necessarily have thought there's a conflict of interest, but you might have done your PhD with them two years ago and they haven't thought to say so. So it's important that you declare that you've been involved in, in reviewing the article as well. Um, 
your supervisor can also like delegate the review to you officially, so they can kind of decline and then say, I'm unable to do it at this time, however, my postdoc is able to carry out the review and kind of pass it to you that way. Um, journal clubs, again, Pross mentioned this too. Most departments have some kind of um, journal club, whether it's focused on a specific discipline or a specific aspect where you can kind of post peer review published articles um, and get practice that way. Um, okay, it's show of hands time again. Do you reward, pay, or acknowledge peer reviewers? Who in the room thinks that we should pay our peer reviewers? No, that's not many, only three. Um, that's kind of the, the consensus, is that, um, that there's kind of mixed opinions in the community whether it's a good idea or if it actually improves quality, because you're introducing another incentive into the process. Um, at CUP, we do pay people to do book reviews. Book reviews can be extremely involved. I know that journal articles are as well, but if you're talking like a textbook, uh, where you're you know, being asked to like work through questions at the end of a chapter or something, we pay people to do that. Um, we partner with Publons as well, so that our journals, if you, if you review for journals that are partnered with Publons, then, then you'll get acknowledgement for that through them. Um, acknowledgement listings, most of our journals have, for example, at the end of a year, like, thank you to all our reviewers. Um, some authors choose to acknowledge the reviewers in their acknowledgement. And uh, I think this is a medicine thing, I'm not entirely sure, but some, some institutions will actually give like training and career development credit. So if you do a peer review, they see that as like you have enhanced your professional development, so you can kind of say that you've done your professional development quota for that year. Um, some publishers do things like, you know, reduced APCs if you've reviewed for that journal. Uh, and some do have kind of paid reviewers or sort of data validation specialists. So is anyone wondering why there's pens on the side? Yeah, okay. Um, so this was a funny story that um, one of my ex-colleagues said, he got a letter from an unnamed publisher, uh, an email, um, as an attachment, and it said, Dear Rob, we are, we are just so thrilled that you know, you've had such, uh, such excellent reviews this year. Um, we really appreciate your service to our, to our journal. Um, we, be, we know that you're at this big conference, uh, we'd be really, it'd be really like to thank you in person. Um, so if you could come to our stand, we, you know, we'd like to acknowledge your service. And he was like, oh, that's really nice. I'm so, yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, I have. I've put a lot of work into that. He goes up to the stand and they go, what? Oh, sorry, we had some pens, but they've all gone. So, <laughs> and that was like, that was the reward for his, you know, like peer review service. Um, he still liked the letter, though. Like, it, it was still nice to receive a letter from the publisher saying, like, thank you for your service. Um, but I thought that was kind of funny, but this grand introduction to coming up to the stand. Um, the next thing is kind of about ethics. So um, is there a code of conduct or a contract for peer reviewers? So as Karina mentioned earlier, uh, this has been in the news recently because you know it's not necessarily obvious, like when you sort of submit an article and you sign your copyright form or whatever, um, that you actually do something on a dotted line. Is there a contract for peer reviewers? And um, the short answer is, uh, it depends on the journal. Uh, most of them will have guidelines, and when you accept a review, it's like implicit in those guidelines that you have accepted their guidelines. So you'll be saying, I will accept to do this according to the policies of this journal. So in that sense, it, you are agreeing to, to perform a service in accordance with their guidelines. There is a very good code of conduct, though, that regardless of whether or not whoever you're publishing with signs up to the committee on um, publication ethics, they have a really good, short, bullet-pointed, what is good practice for peer review. And if anyone's interested in this, there's some kind of little flyers at the back that any resources that I mentioned, there's like a link to them on the flyer, so you can take one of those with you. Um, when do you declare a conflict of interest? So this is pretty much anything that you feel would hinder your ability to assess a manuscript objectively and fairly. Uh, we've had instances where it's been like a husband and wife, and they've had you know like different names, and the husband's been asked to review the wife's paper, and they've been like, I don't think that's, I don't think I can do that. Um, institutional collaborative, maybe you you did your PhD with them, maybe you co-authored a paper with them a few years ago, you should always declare that. Um, there are some more complicated things that maybe more often apply to reviewing grants, but there's like financial conflicts of interest. If it's like competing with your grants, you might want to declare that. Um, I had one personally where I had actually reviewed the manuscript for another journal and rejected it, and then got asked to review it for the second journal. 
So I was like, is that a conflict of interest? And in that instance, the editor said, that's actually fine. Um, thank you for declaring it, but you can go ahead and do it. So remember that declaring a conflict of interest doesn't mean you necessarily can't do the review. It just means that you have to acknowledge that there may be a conflict of interest in, in your review. Um, so if in doubt, email the editor and ask. Uh, I don't know if I'm if my papers if papers are fit for my research specialism. I don't feel qualified. Should I say yes to reviewing? Um, first of all, if it's completely inappropriate, and I've been asked to review for like nanotechnology, and as a forest ecologist, like I don't know why I don't know what algorithm matched me to nanotechnology, but that's really yeah. So if that's the case, it could be a predatory journal. So just ignore it and don't waste your time, or just hit decline. Um, what you can do is, if you're unsure, ask the editor. So if you if you think it could be a fit, but you're just not quite quite sure, ask the editor because there might be a particular reason why they have asked you. Um, or you can accept it and say, I'm happy to comment on these aspects, but not these ones, or I don't feel I'm qualified. Um, remember that everyone did a first peer review at some point, so you'll probably feel a bit wary of it, but um, go for it. Um, and the other thing you can do is, sorry, yeah. Um, so, there is no formal mechanism to kind of change my opinion about reviewing that paper. I initially accept it because I mm. read the abstract and the title, and I think, oh yeah, that's close enough. Yeah. And when I read the paper, I suddenly realize that, <laughs> you know, what they said in abstract is just a small fraction yeah. of the paper, and I don't feel confident. Um, I think it would be nice to have a more formal mechanism. During peer review, I can then say, well, actually, I don't think I'm qualified, yeah. or I'm going to do it because I accept it, but please, I want to explicitly say in a quick and easy way without writing two pages in my review explaining why I think I'm not yeah. qualified, but quickly to tell the editor, actually, maybe I'm not the right person, and yeah. that would be my best shot. So I think in that situation, uh, and that's actually happened to me before as well, the best thing to do is is to email the editor back as soon as you sort of realize and just say, I'm really sorry, I, you know, I did accept. Um, but, I, you know, upon viewing the manuscript, I don't think that I'm the best person to review this. And if you know someone who might be, then it's like extra helpful um, to increase the turnaround of the article if you, if you say, like, but this person might be better equipped or know more about this particular area. Um, I think the key thing is that if you have accepted, to let the editor know as soon as possible if you can't do it. And that could be for any reason. It might be because, you know, you've suddenly been told that you have to go off to the field in three weeks and you won't be able to submit it on time, or you've got a conference that you didn't know you had to present at, whatever. Um, just let the editor know that you, you can't do it as soon as you realize that you can't. Which is kind of the last point here is like, do you have time? Um, regardless of whether it's in exactly in your area or not, it's, it's best just to say, I'm really sorry, but I don't have time just now, than to kind of think about whether you have time for a while and then tell them. Um, okay, so this next bit is kind of into the meat of actually writing a review. Um, and although it might be tempting to do this, this isn't what, what you would do. Um, it's kind of funny because there's probably a shred of truth. Like as with a lot of cartoons, there's probably a little bit of a shred of truth in it. It might be tempting to think some of these things. Um, but as I think Plus had some really good examples earlier of, you know, don't just write, yeah, seems fine. or um, these people are clearly incompetent. Like that, that's not a peer review. Um, this one's a really interesting one, but I know a lot of people have kind of raised in previous sessions, and friends of mine have said that they struggle with, uh, is how, how detailed should you be with spelling and grammar? And the first thing I'd say is check your reviewer instructions. So at CUP, we, we publish um, humanities journals and science journals. And one of the differences that we notice is that in humanities subject areas, sometimes you actually are in your reviewer instructions, like asked to comment on the kind of presentation and framing of the argument, and that's actually part of the review process, is saying, like, has this person put together, like, a, a excellent piece of writing on this topic? Um, so you might actually be asked to do that if it's, like, a humanities subject. Um, if not, then I've kind of got three, three ways that you can approach it. The first one is, if you really can't understand it, if it's not clear, uh, which basically means you can't objectively review it, um, then you should return it to the editor and say, you know, you know, I think this looks interesting, if it does, um, but I honestly can't like, assess this objectively. 
um, perhaps the authors would benefit from a language editing service and then I'd be happy to re-review. Um, so you can say that. Second scenario is kind of the tricky one. That's where in some instances you're like, I think I know what they mean, but I'm not, it's not entirely clear. Uh, and if you really dig into it, then you can tell from the context what they mean, but it's not unambiguous. Uh, and that's really the important thing. If, if it could be, you know, if it's not clear and objective, then, then you should call it out. Um, and in this case, really, the best thing to do is kind of review it as usual, but make sure you point out in the text where these kind of um, unclear bits pop up. So I had an example personally where I was asked to review a paper on um, taking processes that happen through leaves and kind of expanding that up to the canopy. What the authors had done is they confused green matter with leaf. So they would occasionally put like the green matter had done this. And it's like, well, if you're trying to compare leaves and leaf, then it's kind of important that the right one is definitely in the right place. And you could always tell in the paper which one they meant, because like the context of the, the whole sort of paragraph was that they were talking about a particular method or a particular result. And you'd know that that's what it referred to. Um, but it wasn't unambiguous. Uh, and then the last one is basically just cosmetics. It's like you think you'd have written it differently, or it's maybe not particularly elegant, but it's like unambiguous what they mean. Um, so in that case, just review it. Like you've been asked to review the science, uh, and that's what you should be focusing on. Um, for this one, I don't think I'll spend too much time on this, because I'm aware that I am the only thing standing between you all and wine. Um, so, <laughs> so I will just refer you to the British Ecological Society Peer Review Guide. I don't know if you've come across that before. Um, but even if you're an experienced peer reviewer, it has some really good uh, like thought-provoking questions for each stage of a typical article. Uh, and it just kind of prompts you to kind of think about what you should be thinking about in each particular section and, and how it's most helpful to write those up in the absence of any other guidelines. So obviously journals have their own way of, you know, like reporting on a peer review. Some of them give you a template. Some of them have, please do inline comments on the PDF. Some of them say, please just write a short paragraph. Uh, it, it, it depends. Um, but if there's nothing explicit, then this is a good guide to follow. Um, this is another interesting one. Um, do I need to comment on fit for the journal or just the science? Here I would say, again, it varies depending on the journal. Uh, in the absence of anything, just comment on the science. That's the important bit. Um, but what you might find is that you have specific instructions. For example, in the letter you get from the editor, it might say, we would particularly appreciate your views on part X. And that might be because the paper has been previously rejected and they now want to know from someone else if this is a, you know, if this has been addressed. So they're seeking other views on an issue that they're already aware of. So they might ask you to write comment particularly on that. Um, nearly every journal should have an instruction for reviewers' documents, and that can, that's a really good source of like what they're expecting you to comment on. Um, and if they don't ask for anything apart from the science, you can include your opinion. But I mean, it's the editor's call as to whether it's a fit for the journal, really. The reviewer's job is mostly to comment on the, the soundness of the science. Okay, so I promised I'd tell you how long the average review takes. Apparently it's nine hours. So maybe my two hours a day for a week wasn't actually that far off. Um, but obviously it depends on how familiar you are with the topic, um, how long it is, um, how experienced you are. Maybe you've got your own process and you've got it down and you know exactly how you kind of normally write your letters and respond to things. Um, so there you go. Median five, mean nine hours. I don't know if that sounds familiar to people. Quite a lot of time. Uh, and I put this one on its own because I thought it might be controversial. Um, can I make my review public? So in general, no. Um, it's mostly because the majority of journals do have their own policy and what you can do with it is dictated by that. And it's not just your decision. As Karina said earlier, most of them allow you to sign your reviews unless it's a double blind, double blind process. Um, but there is a trend towards more open peer review, as we've heard earlier today. So some of the things to consider, um, as has been mentioned earlier, Publons. So they basically take care of that for you. So you can submit that, you know, you can say that you've reviewed for a journal and they will automatically um, make the appropriate information available according to the journal's policy. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is the author's wishes. So you might think that it's really exciting that you've just reviewed an awesome paper on like meerkats or something, and you might put it on Twitter and be like, oh, I've just done this awesome paper for meerkats for a journal or whatever. And the other reviewer might read that and go, oh, is it, 
I wonder if that's the same one I'm doing. You know, and it kind of interferes with the process. Um, same thing with the author. Uh, they, they might not want to know who you are. It's kind of like a personal thing, I guess. Um, I would also recommend that you look at the Pope case studies. There's lots of really, really fascinating things on there of what, you know, where reviewers have been added to a paper in the acknowledgments when they didn't want to be. Um, they've had authors who have publicly kind of denounced their reviewers and sort of said, you know, I, I don't agree with this review. And they've called out the reviewer and sort of published editorials about how terrible the reviewer was. And there's lots of really interesting cases. Um, and they all have like what the verdict of the case was and the reasoning behind it. So it's, it's quite interesting to look at some of those. Um, I think that was it for the first section. I thought I would let everyone have a chance to breathe, ask questions. Yep. So. Thanks so much. I want to come back to that point um, on um, paying reviewers and so on. Yeah. Where you had the, the call. Um, is it basically uh, possible to be just a reviewer without a reader? Right, so is there something like like a profession of reviewer, or is it part of things being discussed within journalism? Um, yeah, so depending on the size and the setup of the journal that actually exists already for some journals, they have um, like their own editorial office, and in that case, the editorial board is essentially the board of reviewers. So they're like brought in house and they're paid as reviewers for a particular journal. Um, they will always seek like extra, you know, like extra reviewers if they need them. But they do. There are some journals where people are paid for their services as a reviewer already. Um, there are also a few websites like what's it called, Peer Wick, maybe. I think that's. And, and what they do is they basically list manuscripts, almost like jobs, and then you can kind of bid to do a job. Um, so it's like you're being a freelance consultant or something, and you can, you know, say that yeah, I'm happy to do this, and you have your hourly rate or whatever, and you can review journal articles. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there are there are sort of initiatives that exist. Um, there's also, or there was, Axios, where you sort of pay a fee and then they organise the review for you. Um, and so the people there that sort of work on peer review. So there are various initiatives for, for paying peer reviewers. And increasingly, a lot of journals have in-house data specialists or statistics specialists, and they will sort of be the person who goes through and checks how sound the stats are. So you mentioned earlier that sometimes in some journals they ask the author to suggest some reviewers. Yeah. What happened to those? I mean, do they actually consider them or they just put them aside? That's uh, the first question. Um, the second question, I mean, it's very common that sometimes you get the referee's report. One of them is very nice, accepting the paper. Yeah, yeah. Another one is horrible, just like rejecting your paper. Yeah. What do you guys do in that case? I mean, if you get, let's see, three referees, one is saying this is absolutely rubbish. Yeah. And two is saying this is nice. What would you do? Um, so I'm going to ask you to hold that thought because we've just very nicely introduced the next section of my talk. Um, the first question in that is suggested reviewers and non-reviewers, what do you do with those names? Um, so as with most things, it's the editor's call. Um, often what happens is if you suggest three reviewers, they'll only use like one of them or you know, they don't they don't just go, okay, fine, yes, we'll use all of those. Um, interestingly, Sometimes they do that with non-reviewers too. So if you say someone that you don't want to review the paper, they don't necessarily ask them to review the paper, but they might sort of gently ask why they think this person might have named them as someone not to review the paper. Or they might just do their own background research and sort of say, ah, oh, right, that must be why, it's because they worked on this paper last year. You know, so it could be it could be obvious, but sometimes it's it, it's interesting why people specifically say, don't let this person review my paper. Um, even if you're not asked to recommend reviewers, you can. That's quite helpful. Um, it's really helpful if you say why. So you might be able to say something like, you know, I think Jack would be great at this at reviewing this paper because he has extensive experience with this model organism that I have used, um, which would be complementary to whoever. And that's quite useful. So you can suggest that. And the same with non-reviewers. It kind of shortcuts that whole process if you say, I worked with him recently on developing this method, so I don't think it's appropriate for him to review the paper. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Um, can you hold the thought for a little bit? Does anybody want to know what percentage of papers are rejected? 
and why. Well, they're kind of up there. So, um, This is a very busy slide, and I think we've had a lot of discussion about this today already. Um, but we have been asked, which is best? And our editors ask us this as well. So because editors don't necessarily look at the whole publishing landscape, they're working on one particular journal, they quite often ask for like the publisher's advice on how, how their journal should be run. Like, is open peer review better? So it's our job as publishers to kind of look at the whole landscape, look at their discipline, kind of try and understand what might be the best fit for that journal. Um, so we do kind of spend quite a lot of time discussing like which peer review systems work best. And the short answer is nobody knows. <laughs> there isn't one answer. So there have been studies that suggest that um, double-blind review actually helps reduce bias, particularly against um, certain geographical regions, certain institutes, um, career stage. Um, but interestingly, gender is not actually as big a factor in uh, there have been sort of randomized trials where they've swapped off the gender names and stuff, and they found that that's not necessarily, a, it doesn't have as big an impact as they thought it would. But what happens is that um, one journal that flipped from a single blind to a double blind process, they noticed that there was a significant increase in the number of first female authors. So they're like, oh, that's weird, because, you know, most, most studies say that gender doesn't, it doesn't really come into it in the peer review process. And so what they think is actually happening. Um, is that more women were submitting to the journal because they were more comfortable with the double-blind process. Like, if they thought that people didn't know who they were, even if they can realistically probably guess, they felt more comp like confident to submit to that journal. So it's kind of an interesting balance with the, as we've talked about earlier, like improvement of the review reports that you quite often get with open peer review um, and sort of enriching the scientific record, if you like, with the process that goes on behind the articles. Um, Open pre-review, there's also uh, some suggestions that reviewers are more likely to decline to review. So in a way, you're introducing a bias into who's doing the reviewing rather than in the past, it was more like people would generally decline if they were busy. Um, but now maybe people don't review for open journals. Uh, and there's mixed studies on that as well. Um, so the short answer to that is it kind of depends on your personal preference. If you, if you feel more comfortable submitting to a journal where you think your anonymity and any discussions that go on around it um, are preserved, then go for that. If you really value like feeling like everything's transparent, there's no like, skeletons in the closet, like if, if that's what you value, then go for that. Um, someone asked me once, like, does it make a difference if someone's put up a preprint already? Like, does that mean that I can make my review public because they've already put their research out there and they've already opened it for comments? So does that mean you know, that I can just comment on it anyway. Um, and my kind of analogy there is it's a bit like if you bake a cake and you take it to, like, your local town summer fete or something, and you say, like, what does everyone think? Do you like this cake? But you don't necessarily want everyone to know that you've tried to get on to Bake Off with the same cake. It's kind of a similar analogy. So just because you... <laughs> well, it is in a way. It's like you don't... You might be happy to have everyone in your town, like, taste your cake and go, like, yeah, it's great. And they're like, oh, well, it could be better, maybe more flour. Um, but then you might secretly think, oh, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go for Bake Off. And then, you know, you get completely shredded and maybe you don't want that as part of your public record. So it's kind of a personal a personal thing. Um, this is where I'm going to get to the reviewer comments where you said, uh, what do you do if the reviewer's comments contradict one another? So first of all, do I have to address every comment? Yes. Um, but we synthesize, it's generally like if there's a recurring issue, you can just say in response to comments on lines, blah, 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 I have added a paragraph into the discussion which would clarify this, whatever. So you don't have to necessarily go, yes, I did this, yes, I also did this. Um, it's also okay to say why you haven't changed something. I think some people, uh, maybe when they're earlier on in their careers, don't necessarily feel comfortable in saying, um, well, no, because that was very critical to why we did it this way, so I'm not going to change that, and I think it's important that that's there. Um, it's totally okay to do that if you do it sort of objectively and clearly, professionally, and kind of support your argument as to why. Um, I think we've kind of covered that in the British Ecological Society thing. Um, these, I can send the slides around, so if anyone wants to read this, it's probably better than me going through all this. And also I can get to your question about if I disagree or if the reviewers disagree, um, what do you do? So I noticed earlier that this actually spells COPS, clearly, objectively, professionally, and support your argument. 
So I guess you could adopt that if you like as a, a way to respond to reviewers' comments that you disagree with. Um, you don't have to do the, the cartoon thing. <laughs> Um, okay, and here's, here's the answer to your question. What if reviewers' comments contradict one another? So really what should happen is that the editor should pick this up. They should either send it out for further review, so say you had two reviewers and they're both like, this is awesome, this is totally fine and this paper should definitely be published right now, and the other one's like, they need to go to the field again and get another three years of data. Then really the editor should say, okay, I'm going to get a third or fourth opinion on this and send it out again. If you do receive it, then it's essentially the same as disagreeing with comments. You know, I mean, in a way, it's kind of to your advantage because you can just sort of say, well, you know, I didn't follow this reviewer's advice because I think that it's more appropriate with this. And it's part of the discourse and part of the kind of evolution of improving the paper. Um, so explain your position and kind of support it with evidence. Uh, we're almost there. So how long should it take before I get annoyed? How many rounds of review would be acceptable for articles? And can you challenge the decision? Um, can you challenge the decision? Yes. I don't know how many, has anyone ever done that? Has anyone challenged the editor's decision? Yeah. Um, so it's quite rare, but you can do it. Um, interestingly, there's, there's some studies that sort of suggest that men do this more often than women, but women are more likely to have the decision overturned as one of those. And so when, when women challenge them, it's more likely to be overturned. Um, I haven't read enough about that to sort of know the ins and outs of it, but it's just kind of interesting to that. Um, and again, you can do it, but make sure you express why. Um, how long before you get annoyed? So first of all, check that you actually received some form of confirmation from the journal that your article is actually in the process. So you know, it is possible that you... I don't know, if something went wrong with the system or, you know, these things do happen. So if you didn't receive an email saying, your, thank you for your submission, um, here's your Scholar One login or whatever, um, if you didn't get anything like that, then contact the editor. Um, check on the website, because the journal will quite often say, we endeavour to return around all articles within however many months. If it's before that, you're probably not really entitled to be annoyed at the journal. You might be annoyed because you haven't heard anything about your paper, but it's probably not the time to complain to the journal. Um, the other thing you can do is there's a few websites, I think Sci SciBal, I think that's what it's called, um, and it's essentially like a review of journals, so you can go there and quite often people sort of post their experiences with the journal, how long it's taken for their article to go through the journal, what the average turnaround time is, so you can kind of find other information about, about the turnaround time. Um, Often you'll get some kind of system that you can log into, like Scholar One or Editorial Manager, that will show you what state your status your manuscript is at. Um, but bear in mind that publishers really do have different systems here, and that depends on the setup of the journal. So some journals like tell you every single minute thing. So it'll say like, editor has now asked reviewer one or something, and then it'll be waiting for reviewer one's response, uh, and then it will say reviewer declined, and then it will go out again. So sometimes they're quite specific. Other times it's just like paper is under review and it will just sit like that for a long time and you don't know like how many times it's been bounced back and forth, how many have, you know, reviews have been received. Um, so yeah, so just be aware that your experience with one journal might be completely different in terms of the information you get for another journal. How many rounds of review would be acceptable for articles? Um, totally depends. One or two is normal and Martha's not allowed to say anything because she knows the answer to this. Um, do you know what the CUP record is for the most most rounds of review of one article? Any guesses? Six. <laughs> so yeah, um, that's not normal, but yeah, that was that was kind of the, that was the CUP record. Um, this one's a funny one. Uh, I've guessed who one of my reviewers is, and she's trying to block my work. What can I do? Um, Firstly, consider that you might be wrong. We have had examples where people have written really ranty letters to editors saying, like, this person should never have been asked to review my article and it's totally unprofessional and blah, 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 and this review is terrible. Uh, the review might have been terrible, but the point was they had the wrong person. So thankfully, they wrote to the editor and not the person they thought it was, because that would probably have been worse. Um, do some soul searching. Try and look at it like, a, like you're a lawyer, if that makes sense. So, you know, if you've got reviewer one's comments here and two here, if they kind of seem in line with one another and, you know, you don't, 
they are actually reasonable if you kind of look at it objectively and not like this is my baby that I you know produced after five years of labor um, yeah try and try and be objective about it if you do think there's a genuine concern raise it with the editor just say like calmly you know I think that clearly these reviews are out of line with the other uh, this review is out of line with the other review I received and um, I feel that it could be you know this un analysis is unnecessary uh, and you can kind of raise that with the editor and they can then investigate it or escalate it to um, like an after reviewer or whatever uh, and the other thing is like I mentioned before decide what you're comfortable with if you'd just be happy knowing straight out who's involved in the process uh, then maybe go for an open peer review process which kind of gets around all that iffy things um, don't confront them yourselves don't sort of look them up on research gate or whatever and sort of say like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to like blackmail yeah um, don't whinge in the tea room because you never know it could be someone who happens to be in your department at the time who's reviewing it um, and certainly don't rub your hands together with glee next time you get asked to review one of their papers because you assumed it was them that was horrible to you so and I think that was kind of it um, I have other resources and stuff but they're basically all printed out so I think we can just have questions now if you have any other questions Again, um, sounds like um, there is a choice between different uh, peer reviewing mechanisms, but really it's tied to the journal, right? I mean, uh, you have to go to different journals. Yeah. Because in my discipline, it never happens actually anything different from uh, double blind. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of. Yeah. What is actually the share in the group of PIP um, publications that use these different types of mechanisms? Do you have any concrete figures? Um. No, but I will find them for you. I'm going to write in my little notebook. And if you might email, if you have a list of attendees or something, I can email the. Um, so I don't know, but actually, one of the challenges we face is that we quite often try and kind of coax our editorial boards in a certain direction. Um, but they don't necessarily always listen. And they normally own the journal. So, kind of, we have in some situations like limited influence. So, if they don't want to do an open peer review system, it's their journal, essentially. And so we can kind of present the argument to them or suggest that they introduce like a, a data specialist or that they do open peer review or that they, uh, you know, we can make suggestions to them, but it's, it's normally their, their choice for the journal. But I'm going to try and find out how many we have of each system. I know we have at least one triple blind, I think, in politics. Thank you. It's actually not really related to peer review. I should have waited. But what are the links between Cambridge University Press and Cambridge University? To what extent are they linked? Influence each other? Or um, in terms of peer review and open, and open publication. Oh right. To try um, maybe to reframe it <laughs> in the context of. So I speak to these guys. Oh sorry, I speak to these guys a lot. Um, we tend to kind of bounce ideas off each other around like new developments in the field like they've looked at our data and transparency policy and kind of commented and made really useful suggestions for us so we do we do kind of keep in touch with topics like that at a higher level um, CUP basically give money to Cambridge University Press that's kind of how how our setup works and um, so we if we make a profit then the profit goes to Cambridge University which I think I was just talking to Marsha about this at the break um, I think it just goes into the chest, as it's called, at Cambridge, and, and that's used to kind of fund research and teaching at the university. So, so that's kind of official link. Um, but we sort of work together. I'm on the research data management group as well, so we kind of share knowledge, basically. Thank you. This leads me to say thank you very much to all our speakers and our sponsors. I found it really interesting. I hope you found it very interesting. I wish this was something I went to as a PhD student because I sat there for nine months waiting for a paper to come back from review once because I was too nervous to do anything and write. 